Okay, my name is James L. Jennings. I was, grew up in uh, Daysville, Alabama, Tallapoosa County. Uh, grew up on a small farm, uh, mother, father, and uh, five siblings. Uh, we grew up in a, in, a, in a little small house. It was like six of us. Uh, grew up in like a three-bedroom three bedroom house. So, so, you know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but we had a lot of pride. Always had plenty to eat because we, uh, we grew a lot of our food. Um, as a young person, I went to um, elementary school at a two-room schoolhouse. That was a class uh, one through three and four through six. And we had two teachers from one taught one through three and one taught uh, four through six. So in school, I, I, you know, learned pretty fast. So I got moved up to the second grade uh, early and then third grade and then eventually to the fourth grade. And uh, but when we got to the sixth grade, the teacher wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't skip me. She wouldn't let me go because she had to go to a high school then, and she said I was too young to go. So I essentially went through the sixth grade twice. You know, I was kind of helping other students and kind of wasted a year, I guess. And after then, I went to high school in uh, Camp Hill, Alabama. It would be, it would be a high school uh, where I went to school at there. And, and there I was fortunate enough to have some really good teachers. Uh, my math teacher, he had gone to Alabama A&M and and he actually came back after school to te teach us trigonometry because if you didn't have at least eight students want to take a class, the state of Alabama wouldn't pay for, the, for anybody to teach it. So, so uh, Frank Holly, uh, I still give him a lot of credit today for me being able to go into math when I went to college at Alabama A&M. At Alabama A&M, I majored in math and minored in physics. Um, Dr. Howard J. Foster was at A&M. And he started the physics program there. So I was fortunate enough to be one of the first students at Alabama A&M to minor in physics. And now they have a PhD program in physics out there. So, you know, what started as small grew into something great. And while at Alabama A&M, I started co-oping at NASA. So that's how my career started at, at NASA as a co-op from Alabama A&M University. I guess I kind of got disinterested in school and decided I wanted to do something else and I went to the co-op office and, uh, and that was opening at NASA so I, I was hired to come to NASA. And my first uh, job at NASA was a computer operator in basement of building 4200 so that's where I started at it. And I was fortunate enough to have a lady that took an interest in, in me and taught me how to operate the computer. So I operated the computer for a couple co-op periods, and after graduation, I came and, uh, to work for NASA full-time. Uh, the experience for me was uh, a little different because I had always been in an all-black environment as far as formal organization was concerned. So when I came to NASA to co-op, this was my first experience in a all predominantly white um, uh, environment. So. You know, I was kind of apprehensive and excited and uh, all, all in one, but it turned out that I, I found that, that I could perform in that en environment, so um, it, it worked out really well. Yeah, when, I, when I first came to NASA, uh, at that time there wasn't very many uh, blacks in, in, in NASA, especially out, out here at Marsha. Uh, I was a part of the, of the comp lab, and I think the comp lab had more more black employees than, than any other organization out here because there were some guys that had been uh, in the comp lab since, um, I guess, since the inception of NASA. They was working uh, for the Army when they moved those uh, guys over to NASA, so they were there. So, so and I, I knew some of those guys, so they kind of, uh, you know, helped walk me through the pace and, and, and told me what to expect, so that, that was pretty good. Uh, my um, my first supervisor was named Rick Seager, and uh, he was one of those supervisors that, you know, kind of let you do your own thing. He didn't give you a whole lot of guidance, and at that time, I thought I needed some. So, you know, I would go to talk to other people about, you know, what I should be doing and, and that type of thing, and, and, and that worked out very well. One of the things that I, I learned kind of early on was that, you know, my skill set and, and my academic learning was on par with people that was going to like Alabama, Auburn and that thing. So that, that was one of the things that I, I guess gave me the confidence that, you know, I guess to feel like I belong and that, that I could do the work, you know, because, um, you know, I could solve the same problem that people could from the majority universe. So I thought 
my education was, was good. And so then it was my job to go and get as much experience as I could. So I, uh, I took on every job that I could, you know, job within my organization, outside of my organization, anywhere that I thought I could do something to help, I did it. So that, that helped me a lot because I start getting, um, you know, letters and stuff from other organizations to my boss saying, I don't know, Jenna's helped me with this problem, help me with that problem. So, so I always believe that you need to make yourself valuable within your organization, but more importantly, valuable outside of your organization, because at some point, if you're moving up the career ladder, you know, you're going to have to have somebody supporting you from outside of your organization. I was fortunate enough to be on the first uh, Equal Opportunity Board, NASA-wide, that was started in the early 70s. And, and my, you know, my experience on that board, you know, got me uh, exposed to all of the deputy center directors around the agency, all of the, uh, all of the EEO officers, and it started laying the groundwork for, you know, making equal opportunity a subject and a dialogue in the agency. And, uh, and I think from that, over the years, you know, we, we made progress. Uh, we have made enough, but we, we have made progress. We have uh, people in positions. We have people that uh, African American and senior positions here at, uh, at the Space Center. Uh, and back then, I think the highest grade we had was like a GS-14 when I came in, and now we have four or five SES uh, blacks here at the center. So, so we've made progress around the agency. I think we need to uh, continue that progress because one of the things I found out during my career, if, if you are at the table, it makes a difference in the decision that come out of those meetings. So I know um, I, was, um, in a, I was deputy center director down at the Kennedy Space Center and I was able to lead and guide people to, to understand a lot of the issues that, that black people had and, and things we needed to do to fix it. So the more people that you have at the table uh, of diversity, the more diverse the decision will end up being. So, so I think that is important. Uh, another thing is important when you're trying to develop people is expose those guys to a special projects as much as possible. One of the things I did in my career I see a young person that I thought had talent, and I put them on a committee or something. And a lot of those folks are, are the leaders in NASA today because they were given the opportunity, and then other people saw that they had ability. And so, so those things are important too in developing people. You know, it, it's like anything else. You know, uh, people have to feel comfortable with you, and you have to feel uh, comfortable with people. And one of the ways that you can do that is, is socializing outside of work. I know one of the things that we had when I went down to Kennedy, we had like a government accounting association. So, you know, and, and all of the people in the control of the organization and management was a part of that. And I used to attend those meetings, and, and I used to try to get other blacks to, to go, and they said, well, I don't want to waste my time after work doing this. But, you know, they didn't realize that, you know, people have to feel comfortable with you, too. If they don't know you and they don't know your background, you know, when you're making a decision, if people got equally technical ability, you're going to pick the one that you feel more comfortable with. So, so you have to do that. It's important that you, uh, you uh, let people get to know you and you get to know people. So I think that's one of the, one of the important things that, uh, that you try to do. You know, I have kind of got a little 10 point, you know, the Jennings ground rule for success. And one of those is, uh, you know, get to know your management and make sure your management get to know you. Because that's, that's very important that they know you, you know. And uh, you know, like I said earlier, let people outside of your organization understand uh, that you can help them and, and help them when you can. You know, treat everybody with respect. You know, that's that's really important. No matter from the from the janitor to the guard to you know the center director, everybody should be treated with respect. That's one of the things that make me feel good today when I go back down to Kennedy or go to headquarters. Um, the first person you run into is the security guys, and they, hey, Mr. Jennings, how you doing? You coming back? I'm saying no. I think they've tired of me. And they don't want me back, but. But it's good just to treat those guys well so that, so that they would know you. And I learned that from a guy named George English down at Kennedy. He would always go down the hall, speak to the janitors, he'd speak to everybody. 
And so I'm saying that's a, that's a good point you need to do, you know, just go out of your way to acknowledge people. And one of my things is that everybody is equally important. And, and, and I always get the question, of if we're equally important, uh, why don't we get paid the same? <laughs> so my answer to that is that you're equally important, but you're not equally valuable because I can, I can hire a uh, accountant a lot cheaper than I can hire an engineer, you know, so it all works, you know, in the long run of things. It's not good. I guess that's kind of bottom line. It's not good because I, I don't think enough um, African American students are getting exposed to STEM education early enough. Um, what 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 happens is that you know a lot of the elementary school teachers that teach in math are not math majors, so they're doing it on the side. So so they they don't make um, they don't make math exciting. Um, it's hard for them, so they, they, they let the students think it's hard for, for them. I, I remember when my daughter was in the uh, fifth grade and she was taking math, and uh, you know, she had, uh, you, know, I, you know, helped her because I was a math major, so all of her work was, was an A, and at the end of, uh, at the middle of the semester, you know, her grade came home and she had like a B plus in math, so. I went to went to see the teacher, and the teacher wanted to know what the problem was. I told her I needed to understand her grading criteria because every paper was a was an A, every test was an A, and I didn't understand how she got a B because I didn't I didn't want her, you know, thinking math was hard, and she'd worked hard, and uh, and and so she she got A's all the time because I mean she earned them, but she, but that's part of the thing what the teachers end up doing to discourage people, but. But one of the things we need to do is expose, um, you know, black kids to, to math and science as early as we can and to let them see the importance of math and, and the things that, that can happen to them if they study math. So you need to start early because math is one of those subjects where you build on what you learned yesterday. And if you miss a few steps in between, there's no way to catch up unless you go back and, and build that foundation. So what happened? kids miss the basic foundation and by the time they get to middle school, you know, they can never do math because they don't understand basic fractions and all this thing. So, so I think we gotta, we gotta spend more time on the younger kids to get them to understand the concept, exposure to things like NASA, the Space and Rocket Center, and places like that so they can see what's, what's happening there. And, um, and then just, just provide better teacher training so that they can teach math to young people so that they can understand it and make it fun. I look at math and science as one of those, those equalizing areas because no matter what your background is, if you know how to work the problem, can't anybody say it's wrong, you know? So that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I like math because, you know, based on, you know, my knowledge of the, the formulas in the background, if I work the problem, it's right no matter, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, teacher you got or what they want to think. So, but, you know, we really, in this whole country, to me, it's, it's, we have to uh, do a better job in STEM education. Uh, if you look around the world, you know, we rank way down in, in the number of uh, kids that study math and science all over the world. So, and to me, that's what made us great, you know, our technology advances and that. And if we don't pay more attention to that in this country, um, you know, we're going to fall behind, and I don't think that we'll be able to be continue to be the leader in, in the science area. Uh, I often tell people that the biggest wall that we're in is in education and in, in the STEM area, because if we lose that wall, the technology of around the world will just overtake us. You know, early on, when I was uh, first started school at Alabama a and we, we didn't have a lot of the equipment, we didn't have the, the computers, we didn't have a, a lot of the lab equipment that they have now, but one of the things that we did have then, we, we had instructors that was really interested in, in teaching you to learn. So I, I know I often use a, a Dr. Howard Foster as an example. He taught us physics, and we didn't have a lot of lab equipment to do the experience, in this, but he, uh, you know, he made us derive our formulas mathematically 
you know, and, 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 and work the, the whole problem and understand the concept from a theoretical standpoint as well as from an application. So we, we learned, I think we really learned the basis more, although we couldn't, you know, didn't have the equipment to do a lot of the experiments. I remember one of the experiments that we did was um, like the, um, the electronic uh, resistance. And, you know, we set up this little thing and, and cooked the hot dog. And, you know, you know, most of us had never seen anything like that done, that you could plug in some electricity and do a little resistor thing and put a little fork on the end of it and put a hot dog on it to cook. So, so those small experiments gave you an idea of, of, you know, what you really could do with technology and how it worked. So I think today, you know, the black colleges, they have a lot more equipment. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know whether the students are as eager to put in the work to learn as, um, as, as in the past, but I think that they still do a good job in, in teaching the technical areas. Um, for instance, Alabama A&M, when I went, the physics department was just getting started, and now they have a PhD in physics, so they've been able to bring in uh, some, a lot of professors with PhDs to, to do a better job there. I, I think, Going back to our earlier conversation, I think that one of the issues still is we don't start early enough with students. And a lot of students, when they come to college, they're not prepared to, um, you know, to do STEM work. Because th these days, you know, I took calculus as a, as a junior in college, and now, you know, you expect it to know calculus as a freshman when you come to college. So, so you, we got to do a better job in the high school to getting uh, students involved in these uh, high-level math classes for them to be able to, uh, to major in the STEM program once they get to college. Yeah, I, th I think I'd go back to, uh, and, uh, you know, the whole thing of exposure. I think NASA can do the, a better job of exposing underprivileged kids to technology and let them know the possibility of things. We have a lot of programs, you know, where we, um, reach kids that's in school and already in some math classes or, or science classes, but we need to go into these um, uh, underprivileged areas like the projects around Huntsville and, and, um, and just have technology demonstrations. You know, NASA used to have a uh, technology bus that you used to go around from community to community and just to show people and kids could come through there to see that. I think we could spend more money on that, that, that again. We could go down to Benford Coat or some of these uh, projects around Huntsville, you know, once a month and just have kids get exposed to this. Um, and, and NASA has a lot of, uh, I guess, program that allow you to, to get within NASA. You know, they got the interns, they got the, it's not called a co-op anymore, but uh, pass whatever they call them these day, pathway. But see, we, we get more kids involved in those programs, give them experience here to come in, and then, and then hire them at the end of the program. Um, back in the well, 70s and 80s um, and 90s, NASA had, had some good program with uh, like Mohawks and Spelma, and they would pay the way, kids way to college but they didn't offer them jobs at the, end of, at the end of the program. So we were spending a lot of money educating kids, and those kids were going to graduate school, going working for other companies, because you know we at NASA didn't offer them a job. So, so there ought to be a way where we uh, say, tell the kids, okay, we're gonna give you this scholarship. You go study at the end of this scholarship, then there's a job waiting for you at the end of, at the end of, of this work. So, so I think we could do a better job in uh, uh, exposing NASA technology to kids at a younger age, uh, especially kids that don't have the opportunity to come to like the Space and Rocket Center, come to NASA because they have parents working here, uh, make a concerted effort to do that, and then uh, structure our program so at the end of the education, if a kid wants to come to NASA, they have opportunity to have a job there. Uh, so I, I'm working with, with, with a group that's trying to get these underprivileged or underserved people uh, 
expose the science and engineer. And, and one of the things we do, we, we go to the community and, and, um, and have like, other people come in to, uh, to talk to them. There's, there's a lot of people that want to help, but they don't know how to get to the kids. So this group is uh, they're identifying the kids, they're working with them. So, you know, they, when, they, when they had the, uh, with my, my brother keep a program out here, you know, they was able to, to get NASA in touch with these kids and bring them out. So to get exposed and have somebody to work in those communities to do it, we're also working with the school system, you know, the Huntsville school system on some programs to make sure we identify those kids. So, so I think those are the things we have to do, you know. Once you identify them and once you get them to where you can take them places, you know, there's, there's money to, to do it, but to have the people that know what the kids are and can go and network in those communities, that's, that's one of the things that's really lacking. So, so you gotta work on doing that. So it's, it's a lot of work to be done, and one of the things, we need more integration of all these efforts, you know? Uh, it, everybody see it as a problem, everybody trying to do that little thing, but there's not a lot of coordinations in the doing it. But that's another thing we're trying to do is, trying to coordinate some of the efforts that people are doing to, to work together to get a bigger umbrella of it. And one of my things was, is always that you can't just do it with the, uh, with the schools, you know, it's gotta be done with the whole community and you got to, um, you know, you, you got to get the social services organization working with the education organization to able to be able to make an impact, you know, to some. You know, social service over doing one thing, the schools are doing another thing, but both of them have rules. So the problem is you don't have that bridge to get people talking together and working together to help the whole, you know. So, so that's one of the big things, especially with the, with the, um, the schools, you know. It's, well, we can't teach this class unless we have X number of students having, and there's a certain level of qualification you got. Well, if you miss that step back there, you know, they're not going to take a a uh, 13 year old and take him back to fractions again. So, you know, you just lost. So you gotta have something in between that's willing to go take a kid where he's at and trying to bring him on, you know, so. Um, 